to Speak the Word with Bible teacher Joanne Ramsey. Please join Pastor Ramsey now as she continues to teach God's soldiers how to wield the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Speak the Word. God's Word. Tonight I've titled my message is called Talk a Good Fight. <laughs> and the power of consistency. And I think that just follows right into line with what I normally teach. Uh, according to Proverbs 21, 23, it says that whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from troubles. How you like that? Saints, the word troubles translated in today's scripture verse actually means anxieties. In other words, he said, don't speak your worries. You know, we're really bad about that. You know, anything that's going on in our life, we make a, a, just a V-line, you know, to the telephone. And they tell our neighbors and, and, uh, and get their opinion on everything. But worry is simply negative thinking. It's negative thinking about people, places, things, or situations. And worry is actually, you know, you probably don't think about this, but worry is actually a lack of confidence in God's protection and lack of confidence in his provision. So when we're worrying, it's kind of, you can't worry and have faith at the same time. They, 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 don't, they don't go. It's kind of like water on a duck's back. It, you know, it's just, it's just not gonna work. You know, I told a series not long ago called Satan Attacks Through Your Thoughts. Satan is the one that is putting these negative thoughts into your mind, but you just need not to take them. You have a choice, saints. You don't have to take everything. Just because he puts that thought in your mind does not mean that you have to take it. As a matter of fact, the Message Bible says in Proverbs 21, 23, it says, watch your words and hold your tongue. He said, you'll save yourself a lot of grief. You will. So many believers, you know, and I know this is true, that so many believers don't recognize the importance of what they think about. And they surely don't think about the words that's coming out of their mouths either. I mean, they, you know, they just, you know, like a faucet, you know, just runs off. As a matter of fact, most believers don't recognize the power that is directly under their nose. Because this is where your power is, right here. Saints, worry mounts up in your mouth. So when you're speaking, that worry mounts up in your mouth. And then worry is then spoken through your lips. And once it's spoken, this is what you need to remember. It mounts up in the mouth. And then once you speak it, it becomes a reality. Okay? It did not become a reality until it, after it was spoken. Okay? So when apprehension and forebodings and doubts and fears become audible, they become real. A revelation that the Lord gave me a long time ago. He said that when I speak words contrary to what his word says, he says, I'm actually giving Satan a foothold. I'm actually giving him access into my life. And this is what you're doing. So when he gave me this revelation, I began to pray this prayer. I said, Lord, I pray today that you will put a guard on my mouth so I won't give Satan a foothold. And this is what we have to do. We're constantly having to pray. Uh, the message translation says, words are powerful. Take them seriously. That's what the Bible says. They're powerful. Your words are powerful, he says, and take them seriously. Saints, words can be your salvation. However, words can be your damnation. They can be your damnation just as easily as they can be your salvation. Many believers don't realize how detrimental their words are in producing their outcome. You know, I was thinking today, I was talking uh, with David, I was on the treadmill this morning. I, you know, I get a lot of revelation when I'm on the treadmill. <laughs> Just like the little ever ready bunny there. <laughs> but, you know, I, I never thought about it. I know that I teach the Word all the time, and I know people probably are thinking, well, doesn't Pastor Joe ever run out of messages? talking about the word. No, I never will run out of messages. And I heard uh, Pastor, um, somebody say this about Pastor um, uh, Kenneth Hagin, you know, he was always teaching on faith. And they said, you know, he could teach hundreds of messages on faith. And they were thinking, would he ever run out of messages to preach on faith? No. Brother Hagin never ran out of a message to preach on faith till the day he went home to be with Jesus. And, and I realized that it's more than I'm doing more than just 
teaching the word, teaching you the word, I am discipling you. Because when you're teaching the word, you're discipling the ones that you're uh, speaking to. And I consider it a great honor and a privilege that the Lord would trust me with his word to speak the word, to disciple you. Because when, you, when I'm teaching you the word and teaching you how to take that word and apply it to your circumstances and situations, that's what I'm doing. You're being discipled. Uh, a lot of people, everybody, need, you know, you, you need to win souls. People need, you know, we need to get saved. But a lot of people are out there, they're gathering them and saving them, but they're not discipling them. Right. And, and so, because, you know, there's discipling them. It's, it's just like uh, in, the, in the hospital, and these aren't in my notes, but the Lord is putting this in my spirit. It's like if you go into the hospital on the floor where all the babies are being delivered, it's the same thing. You up there, all these babies are being delivered. I have a daughter-in-law that works, you know, in that section over in Chesapeake. So they deliver all these babies and they're in there, they're helpless. They know nothing. They've never been taught anything. You know, and, and when you become born again, as, as uh, Stanley was just preaching, when you become that new creature in Christ Jesus, you need some instructions. You need to know what to do. You know, so many Christians today are sitting in church that's been there for 30, 40 years, and they still don't know the God's word. And, and you can't act on something that you don't know. You cannot act above your knowledge. You know, and so you have to get the word. And so I've been anointed to teach the word to help you, and so is Brother Larry. You know, we, we, we want you healthy. As a matter of fact, that's in my message down there somewhere tonight, <laughs> is that we both want to see everybody prosper. We want to see everybody healthy in their bodies. I mean, that's our goal. We don't just come up here. You know, I, I worked all day today, worked all day yesterday, and I came in tonight to get dressed to come here. Uh, I don't really think it's so much as work, but I guess it is. I mean, you're doing God's work. And I told my husband, I said, well, I'm tired. He said, no, you're not. I said, well, maybe I'm not. But <laughs> so I reached in the drawer and pulled out a Snickers bar and had half of that. <laughs> Treated myself. But you know, brothers and sisters, we have to get the word. We, we just got to get, we have, we have got to get a better understanding of this word. And this is not in my words either, so I don't know what the Lord's doing, but I'm just being led by the Holy Spirit here because God knows I, I'm just a mouthpiece. But you know, I had a revelation today that most of us are familiar. You know, a lot of people don't recognize the power of coming into agreement with God's word, not God coming into agreement with you, your words, but you coming into agreement with God's words. And, and so uh, I, I'm really familiar with Hebrews 4.12, but and most of you are, you know, it says that his word is sharper than a two-edged sword. And he says it'll cut through bone and marrow, even a divide in the spirit and soul. So we're familiar with that, but I got a revelation today that if you look up two-edged sword in the Greek, Translation, you know what it translates? Two mouth. Wow. Two mouth. Wow. M O U T H E D. Two mouth. That's what two edged sword translates into, is two mouths. And, and, and so I, I think it's, it's so awesome because see, it's seeing like, like when God is speaking the word and then you're speaking the word. It's a two-edged sword, and he says it cuts coming in, and it cuts going out. I didn't bring my sword with me tonight because I didn't know the Lord was going to be talking about the sword. <laughs> I thought he was going to use that in another message. <laughs> but anyway, it, it cuts. And, and, and so uh, it, it says that it, it's sharp, on, you know, it, it's just on both sides. It's just sharp on both sides. So when you're speaking, it, it's not only a, a defensive weapon, but it's also an offensive weapon. And, and so a lot of people don't recognize, but when you take your words and bring them up with God's word, when you, when, you, when you come up and agree with God's word, think of all the power that's in those words. He said they're sharper than a two-edged sword. They'll cut through bone and marrow, even dividing of spirit and soul. In other words, you don't have any circumstance. You don't have anything that those two, that two-edged sword won't cut through. It cuts coming and it cuts going. It cuts both ways. But we're a part of it. We're a part of everything in the Bible. We are a part of it. We have to come in line with God's word and we have to come into a line with agreement with them. It tells us in 
The word tells us in James 2.10, he said, Out of the same mouth, he says, Come forth, blessing and cursing. These things, my brethren, ought not to be so. He says, as a rudder guides a ship and a bit in the horse's mouth causes him to go into the right direction, so also your tongue can guide your thoughts. I want you to think about this. Your tongue can guide your thoughts. It can guide your emotions and your body into paths of prosperity and success, and it can be a tremendous, a tremendous power for good. It can be good. But you also need to know that on the negative side, there's always two sides to every coin, everything. Your tongue can be used to damage and destroy your physical body. It can be used to steal your health, rob you of your finances, and rob you of your family. I mean, it can be used the same way. Your tongue will control your whole thought life. The corrupt words can destroy those around you as well. You know, the Bible tells us in Ephesians 4.29, not to let any corrupt communication come, uh, come out of your mouth, he says, but only words that are good to edify that they may minister grace to the hearer. And you are the hearer more than anybody else. And it took me a while to, to understand that and realize that. And so it's so important. It's, it's good when you're hearing somebody else teach the word. It's good that you're hearing me teach the word or Pastor Larry, but it's even better when you hear yourself speak the word because you are the hearer of what you're saying. So it's going out of the ear down into your spirit, and that's what you're going to have to do. Proverbs 6, 2 says that you're snared with the words of your lips. He said you're caught, in other words, by the speech of your mouth. God tells us in Psalms 32, 9, he says, for you not to be like a horse or a mule, which like understanding, which must have their mouths held firm with bit and bridle or else they will not come with you. He is saying in other words, he said, don't be stubborn like a mule that doesn't have any understanding. In other words, don't let your mouth be the cause of your destruction. He said, don't be stubborn. If you hear the word, he tells you that in the book of James, when you see the word, it's like a, looking into a mirror. When you hear the word, when you hear the word being preached or you're reading the Bible and you read the word and your, your life is not lining up with it, you need to make the correction. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Don't let your mouth keep you from receiving your healing or keep you living on barely get along street. In other words, in poverty. You need to renew your mind. Uh, you need to change your way of thinking. As I said before, I want to help you and Pastor Larry wants to help you. He's anointed us to help you, but you're going to have to practice bridling your tongue. It's, it's all there is to it. Uh, James 2, 6 says, You set on fire the course of nature by what you speak. Think about that, saints. Because just as heaven, I think about this, just as heaven acts on your words, so does hell. Hannah acts on your words. Reset in your mind. And changing the way you think, I know it's not an easy task. I don't stand up here and say that it's an easy task, but I do believe that you can do it. I do believe you can do it. Yeah. Jesus says that we can do all things through Christ Jesus that strengthens us and infuses us with his power, according to Philippians 4.13. And you can do this too. I know you can. You know, the Lord's been helping me for years to change my way of thinking. And he's been teaching me to see things his way and to think his way. And, and I realize I've not arrived. I've not, I've not arrived by any means. It's something that I work on daily. And that's something that you have to work on daily. It's a daily process for everybody, preachers alike. It doesn't make any difference who you are. You know, the word tells us in Proverbs 4, 12, 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man and appears straight before him. But at the end of it is the way of death. Yeah. What God is saying here is that when you speak and agree with the world's way of doing things, that it might seem right, but it really leads to death. It leads to sickness and poverty and destruction. Yeah. When your words line up with the new newscast at the 10 o'clock news or the 11 o'clock news, and you sit in there and you hear this mess, and that's all, it's, it's garbage. You know, it's like taking the garbage can lid off and just filling, filling yourself up with it, then you're, and you're coming into agreement with that. You know, a lot of people will watch, the, at most all commercials, I don't watch anything with commercials, I record anything that I'm going to watch so I can fast forward through them because I know the damage they can do. 
But a lot of people watch those commercials, which most of them are on health and medications, and then they develop the symptoms. But our minds, I want you to know, your mind has been programmed since birth, since day one, to think like the world thinks. And it's going to take some work on your part or our part to reprogram them. You know, think about this, saints. There are actually people that have been abducted and put into cults without their consent. A lot of young people, and these cults brainwash them into doing what they want them to do to get them to think their way. They brainwash them. And when their families finally get them out, now they have to go find someone. They have to go and find a deprogrammer to come in there and deprogram the ones that they rescue. A lot of these uh, are young people, but a lot of them are adults too that get caught up in this. Uh, this is kind of what we have to do. Saints, we are new creatures in Christ now. And God is going to reprogram us through his written word. That's how he's going to reprogram us from the way, you know, the, from uh, not thinking like the world thinks, but to think like he thinks. We have been taught the ways of the world, and the ways of the world is doubt and unbelief and fear. That's the way of the world. You know, every night, if you listen to the news, I don't. The Lord told me 22 years ago, or three, that it wouldn't be good for me to read the newspapers and watch the news, so I don't do it. He said it would affect my faith. And, and uh, I, know, I know that it would because there's so much negative stuff going on there yeah. that it'd be kind of hard for me to keep my mouth lined up with what God's Word says when I'm watching stuff that is exact opposite from what the Word says. And like I said, I'm st don't stand up here and say, I've got it down pat. It's a daily practice. Every day, I got to feed on the Word. I, I, I eat the Word every day just like I eat my meals. Amen. I eat the words every day. I listen to the Word. I speak the Word every day. I don't, I never, t even on vacation, got it right here. And just to make sure, I throw some more books in the suitcase. You know, <laughs> you've got, you can't, some things you just can't take breaks from. You don't have to go through everything every day on your own vacation or whatever or every day, but you need to spend a, a minimum of five or ten minutes every day. You really need longer than that, but anybody can take five minutes a day or ten and, and speak God's word, you know, read a little bit, read some of his word and begin to speak it over yourself. I know you can. I'm busy, but nobody's that busy. <laughs> You know, Romans 2 says not to be conformed to this world, not to be like the world, but to be transformed, he says, by the renewing of your minds. And I know that I'm reading scriptures that you've probably heard a hundred times, but I'm hoping that tonight that you're going to see that God is going to give you a little bit more revelation. You know, transformation is something that takes place on the inside. It's not on the outside. It's an inner thing. It is nothing to do with uh, what you look like at all. Like I said, it's an inner change. Being conformed to the world is something that takes place on the outside, God wants you to experience walking in health, and he wants you to have an abundance in finances. As a matter of fact, in this messages and past messages, I emphasize the importance of your words and how every word that you speak is a seed. This is what it tells us in Luke 8, 11. And the way that you renew and reset your mind to God's way of thinking is by confessing and meditating on his word. Replacing your thoughts and words with what God says about you is the only way. There is no other way that you can renew your mind except through God's word. There is no other way. You have to deprogram your mind. You need to deprogram your mind from the world's way of thinking. Saints, God did not give us his words in parables. Mark 4, 34 says, He spoke to them when he was teaching he spoke to them when he was teaching, but later when they were alone, he did, did teach in parables. But when he was alone with the disciples, Jesus explained to his uh, disciples what he was talking about. So the word is not being taught to us in parables either. He's explained it to us. God gave us his word, and then he gave us the Holy Spirit to help us to discern and understand their meaning. You know, so he didn't leave us down here by ourselves, uh, not knowing that. Uh, he tells us in 1 John 2.20 that you've been anointed and you have 
unction from the Holy One and you know the truth or you know all things. Now, he's not talking about when he says you know all things. He's not talking about your mind. He's talking about your spirit. You don't know all things up here, but you know all things in your spirit. You know, there's things that I'm doing that there's no way I, I don't got it up here. I don't know it. It's like I was telling Monica today, the young lady that's working for me. She was doing things on the computer, and we were, we were having a, a communication problem, you know, because I don't know a lot of the terminology that she knows, you know. And, and so, like I said, I don't have it up here, but the Holy Spirit's the one who taught me how to do what I'm doing. And if I need to know, know that, he'll teach me how to do that too. But as long as she can do it, he doesn't have to teach me that part. One of the revelations that you need is this. There is a war being waged in your mind. That's where the war is. The war is in your mind. This is what Satan is after. He's after your mind. Satan knows that if he can keep you ignorant, he can keep you defeated. You got to have knowledge. You have to have knowledge. God tells you in Hosea 4, 6 that his people, are, he tells you that you're being destroyed for the lack of it, for the lack of knowledge. Saints, the Lord has given me and you a weapon to defend ourselves, and that weapon is his word, Okay. He says here, we're talking about Jesus, you know, and, um, and we, uh, we're talking about using the word in Luke 4, 4, when Jesus was talking to Satan, and what he told Satan, and this is what he was telling Satan when Satan was trying to tempt him, Jesus was telling Satan, he says, it is written that the word of God is the sword of the spirit. It, 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 no, it says, no, Jesus was saying it's written. And what I'm saying is the word of God is the sword of the spirit, which is your weapon. It is the only offensive spiritual weapon that we have, but it's the only one that you need. Uh, Luke 4.13 says that when the devil had ended all temptation, he departed from Jesus, it says, for a season. The wording of this, I want you to listen to this, because it says that he departed from Jesus for a season. So the wording of this implies that Satan exhausted his arsenal of temptation on Jesus and, and then he left, okay? So you have to know, saints, that Satan's power is limited, okay? And tonight I want you to begin to realize and get a revelation that whatever he is fighting you with, it's only a temporary thing. So don't quit. Don't give up. So if Satan is fighting you tonight over receiving a healing in your body over something that you've been prayed over, or in your finances or whatever it is, don't quit. Just, just keep speaking the word, speaking the word. His word tells us in uh, Galatians, he said, if you faint not in due season, you will reap. In other words, you will get victory in whatever area that is that you're fighting, okay? When you speak words of faith, hell just shakes. <laughs> you get up in the morning and start speaking the word. Uh, God has equipped you with the Holy Spirit and he did not leave you here by yourself. Let me repeat that. He did not leave you down here trying to figure things out by yourself. I thank God every day that he didn't leave me down here trying to figure things out for myself. Mm -hmm. I'm standing up here tonight doing things and, and every day doing things that there's no way that I could do in the natural. However, unless you renew your mind on his word as he's instructed us to do, we're going to continue to operate in that same old mindset. In other words, what we need to do is we, have, we need a new mindset. So, because even though that you are in possession, and we are, if you've been born again, you are in possession of the Holy Spirit, of the Holy, and, but even so, you are in possession of the Holy Spirit. You're not going to be able to operate in that power because of your lack of knowledge of the Word. And uh, Pastor Larry talks about this, preaches on this all the time. You have to, in order to operate with the power that God has placed in you, you must have some knowledge about it. There, there's no other way. I want you to know, that, as the Bible says, that you're being destroyed every day. And the reason why you're being destroyed every day is for lack of knowledge. The devil is having a field day with your health and your family and your finances. And until you start arming yourself with his word, Satan's going to continue to eat your lunch and pop the bag. <laughs> You know? Have you ever done that? I used to take my lunch to school. We'd uh, eat their lunch, <laughs> blow it up, and pop the back. And that's what Satan's doing to you. He's eat, you know? 
continue to eat your lunch and pop the bag. You know, you have to realize that God's Word is your book of instructions, you know. I know most of you have heard this before. Bible, B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. <laughs> so that's what we need. We need basic instructions before leaving earth. And, and, and we don't need them once we leave earth. <laughs> we need them while we're down here. Yet, I, I, don't you agree with me? Amen. God's instructions to us are, as believers are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. As a matter of fact, I'd like to share with you an example of what the Lord means by stepping out and grabbing hold of what he wants you to do. Because a lot of times the enemy puts so much fear on us that we don't step out and do the things that he wants for us to do. Back several years ago when I was ministering at the prison before I became the chaplain, God impressed upon me that he wanted to promote me. And the way that he was going to promote me was by making me the chaplain. And secretly, I want you to know, I had thought about becoming a chaplain myself. Uh, but I hadn't done anything to make it happen. I, I really think tonight that the Lord has spoken to some of you in here tonight, maybe and probably more several of you, about doing something, and you secretly have been thinking about doing whatever that desire is that he's placed in your spirit, but yet you haven't done anything about it. You haven't went, you haven't gone and gotten any books to read on the subject. You haven't talked to anybody about how that's done. You haven't done any Googling to find out how that's done. You haven't done anything. But I can tell you this, if the doctors, if you saw something on TV and you thought you had that symptom, you go Google it <laughs> to see what you thought you might have. You know, that they do. You know, that, that's the worst thing in the world. Let me, I, I, this is not in my message. This is the worst thing in the world you can do. If you have to go to the doctor for anything, don't come back and Google it. Don't read as little as you can about what he gives you, too. The least amount, you know? Because, you know, you start reading all this stuff, you're going to develop those symptoms, you know? You don't want to do that. And, and I don't even fill out all the forms. <laughs> you know, if I'm going to the dentist, uh, what, do, what does it matter how many children I had? <laughs> you know, or what my mama died of. I said, I'm not going to fill them out. And if he don't want to see me, he don't see me. But usually they will. But they give you all the stuff to fill out. And, and, and like I said, I, I don't tell them because they wouldn't understand anyway. A Christian would. But I have a new DNA. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I got a new blood flowing through me. Right. I got Jesus' blood flowing through me. And there's none of that in sickness, and either if my mother and dad did have it, doesn't mean I've got it because I've got a new DNA and I got new blood. Amen. You know, yeah. so I, I don't have to, I don't have to bend in to that. It doesn't say that things don't attack me and come my way. They do just like you, but I have to come against them, and I come against them. And if I feel like I still need to go to the doctor, I do that too. Amen. That, that's not going to hurt you to go to the doctor. You know, David went with his eyes this morning. As a matter of fact, the last time he went to his eyes, I was ministering. <laughs> and he was in so much pain, he thought he was going to have to get up and leave because uh, he forgot to bring any, anything with him. And uh, as I was ministering the word and as I was preaching, and, and uh, he was healed. Amen. You know, so you, you don't even have to. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. You, 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 you know, you can be healed just by hearing the word. That's how you get saved by hearing the word. That's how you get healed by hearing that word. That's how everything happens is by hearing the word Amen. and hearing and hearing and hearing because he said that's how faith comes. That's right. You can't pray to have faith. Faith comes by hearing and you're not going to get it any other way. And like I said, he received his healing while he was just sitting there listening to the word. Praise God. But you know... I, I didn't realize at the time that I was having those thoughts, but I didn't realize that when I was thinking about being a chaplain, I didn't realize that God was the one that was active putting those thoughts into my spirit to begin with. You know, God will put, he's the one that gives us th desires. He said he'd give you desires of your heart. And he's the one that puts these thoughts in you. You know, the enemy puts thoughts in you too, but he's not going to put any thought in mind that's going to help anybody or, you know, do any good. But he'd been putting these thoughts in my mind for over a year before I actually took the first step in make, you know, making it a reality. You know, I'm, I'm slow too. Of course, I will have to say that was a long time ago. 
<laughs> and I'm growing. I'm not there, but I'm growing, you know, from babyhood. And uh, I, I, let me go back and explain what I was going to say about the babies in the nursery. I think I, I, I didn't finish that conversation. But I was talking about somebody being born again and not being discipled compared to the babies in the nursery because I think I did say that when they're in there, they, they have no training whatsoever. They can't talk. They can't tell you anything. They don't know anything. They can't do anything. And if you just left them in there and nobody was there to train them, and, and feed them. They got to feed them. You got when you get born again. You got to be fed. You got to be fed the word. You got to be discipled. You got to be trained. You know, most people talk. Uh, you know, Christians speak a different language. I understood that when I first became a Christian. And before I became a Christian, you could talk. I had no idea what you was talking about. I could understand German better than I could. You know what the German? Oh. <laughs> I was in Germany. I could understand them better than I could the Christian. You know. Like I told somebody the other day, when I first became a Christian, somebody wanted to know what my doctrine was. I said, doctrine? I don't know. What, what, what do you mean, doctrine? <laughs> what do you believe? <laughs> she couldn't say, well, what, what, what does your church believe, you know? And I still probably wouldn't have known what she was talking about because I just assumed at that time all churches believed in the Bible and believed in God and taught the Bible, but that's not necessarily true. <laughs> and you learn that the more you grow in the Word that everybody's not teaching the Word of God. <laughs> but you know, saints, because of an old mindset that I had, I couldn't imagine myself in that position because I had the wrong mindset. So I couldn't imagine myself. I couldn't see me. I couldn't see me doing that. But you know, God could see me. He can see you. You know, whatever it is He's putting in your spirit to do, He can see you doing it, even though you might not be able to see yourself doing it. Are you hearing me? Amen. He wanted me to be the chaplain. But, you know, think about this. It was kind of like Gideon, you know. He couldn't see himself as a mighty man of valor. But God saw him as a mighty man of valor and fearless courage. But Gideon didn't see himself that way. You know, Gideon was hiding in the wine press. I wasn't hiding in the wine press, but I was hiding at my home, you know, not really doing anything. But God could see me doing what I'm doing now. And that was, gosh, started, uh, he started putting those things in my spirit probably about 2003 or four. I mean, uh, other stuff he put in earlier. But the things I'm doing now, he started putting in there about four or five. And I, I couldn't see myself. Do, I couldn't even see myself being a chaplain because I didn't have what I thought that I needed to be the chaplain. But this is something we have to understand. It doesn't matter. If God puts a desire in your heart, in your spirit, it doesn't matter whether you have the education. It doesn't matter where you've got the, uh, the, the finances. It doesn't matter if you've got the training because God will train you. Amen. When I started doing the ministry, I said, I could, and I'm thinking, how can I even be the chaplain? I don't even know how to learn the computer. I don't even know how to turn it on. You know, my husband that's deceased, he did all my work for me. And then he passed on, went home to be with the Lord. And uh, it was a year later before, you know, the Lord kept telling me I needed to learn how. And the Lord and I had a talk in the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit taught me how. And he's still teaching me how, you know. <laughs> if I run into a problem, I call one of my husband's tech men. And he, <laughs> and he comes and helps me. But my point is, you don't have to know everything in order to take the first step. You need to take that step of faith. And you need to begin to speak. When the Lord puts something in your spirit, he's going to give you a word. And you go look that up, and then you look up some more words that will back up what he's telling you to do. And then you just begin to stand on them. You know, God will qualify you. He says he does. I think it's in 2 Corinthians 4. That he will qualify you to do what you need to do. God qualified me. He's still qualifying me. Amen. You know, every time he qualifies Pastor Larry. Amen. You know, just because Pastor Larry and I, you know, up here somewhere in age, that doesn't mean we're still not being qualified. <laughs> every, day, you know. every day, every day. But, you know, just as Gideon had to step out, I also had to be the one to step out in faith and grab hold of what God wanted for me. When I thought about that position, all I could see, and this is what I'm sure you do too, when you think about what God has placed in your spirit to do, all you can see is the reasons why you can't. All you can see is the obstacles, and all you can see are the hindrances. That's right. it's, it, but the enemy is the one that's putting them there. You know, because like I said before, uh, being a state chaplain uh, required a lot of degrees and training that I didn't have. 
And I'm so thankful today that I didn't know enough about the computer to Google it. <laughs> because if I had a Googled what was necessary, I know I wouldn't have made it. This is what I'm trying to share with you. I would have been swayed by what I was Googling on the internet. And they were telling me you need this and that and the other. And the enemy would say, see, I told you. You don't, you don't have that. You know, if you don't have that, you, you know you can't do that, you know. And so he would have gotten me so discouraged and frustrated, I, I wouldn't have probably made an effort. But I was just beginning to turn the computer on. And I did ask a friend that worked at the state prison, because I had been ministering there for quite some time at the prison and the jail, if she would help me if I accepted a position. And she said she would. Of course, she left two weeks later. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but you always have the Lord. She didn't totally leave me. She just moved to a different office. <laughs> but she sent somebody else. You know, they brought somebody in. There, but it was not. But the point of it is, everything that the enemy was telling me, and I was afraid that I couldn't do, and was telling me I couldn't do, I never had to do any of it. Wow. It was not required. Uh, the things that I was, had to do was not a part of my job at all. And everything that, uh, anything that had to be done that way, uh, the, somebody else did it. I didn't. So, you know, like I said, a lot of stuff don't ever even happen. But it, he's, he's trying to put fear in you and to keep you from accomplishing what he wants you to accomplish. And like I said, I know that a lot of you out here, the Lord is speaking to all of us all the time and giving us new thoughts and new ideas. But the devil keeps you focused on the giants. But you know, saints, there was one factor I had not considered and one factor that you may not have considered, and that's the God factor. It was, it was not under my own power or knowledge that I would become the chaplain. No more than it's under my own power that I, won't stand, that I stand up and preach all the time or Pastor Larry's. God said it's not by my might nor by my power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. I stand up here not by my might, not by my power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. But it would be through the wisdom and the knowledge of God. It would be through the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in me, qualifying me and directing me to do what he called me to do. Mm -hmm. And I want you to know, too, that it seemed like foolishness to me to even think that I could qualify for this position. And I don't have time to go into all the reasons why it seemed so foolish to me. But take my word for it, it seemed like total foolish, just foolishness to me. And I'm sure that the Lord has told you things. Some of you may have already done it, and some of you have not. I know in my spirit that you have not, because you think it's just plumb foolishness to even think that you could uh, qualify for that or that you could do it. But take my word for it, it's not. It wasn't your idea. That's right. It was God's idea. In 1 Corinthians 1.27, it says, The Word tells us that God selected, deliberately chose. He selected, deliberately chose what in the world is foolish to put the wise to shame and what the world calls weak to put the strong to shame. Well, wow, think about that. God says that He does this so that we can't take the credit, so that we can't boast in ourselves, but He wants us to boast in glory in Him, saints. He wants us to give Him the glory for everything that He does for us. He don't want us taking the glory. He, he will not share His glory with anybody. And it goes without saying that the God factor, without the God factor, I would not have gotten a position without the God factor, I'd not be up here teaching tonight either. So when the Lord revealed to me the scriptures that I needed to confess, that's what I did. I wrote those scriptures down. That's like I was telling you earlier. And I just began to confess them. Saints was stepping out all there was to it. You know, you know, I said, you know, you got to step out and take a hold of what God gives you. But no, it was, that wasn't all there was to it just by stepping out. I had to continue to trust God. I had to continue to trust him to carry me step by step teaching me and guiding me every day, day by day, as I still do today. I have to tr continue to trust God every day, day by day, minute by minute, second by second. And if you feel like God has put something in your spirit, don't just keep ignoring them. Pray and ask God to reveal them and make them more clear to you. He will, make, he will, he will clear them up so that you'll have a better understanding. Are you hearing me? He will. Understand that God will never put anything in you or give you a desire for something that he can't do and that he don't want to do. And like I said, it, don't worry about 
that you don't have the education or the knowledge or the wisdom to do it. God's going to take care of that. God already knows that you can, and he actually has already qualified you to do it. <laughs> okay? So step out. Trust God. He knows you far better than you know yourself. Okay? Amen. And learn to talk a good fight and be consistent in what you do. In other words, keep confessing and keep meditating on the word. And we were talking about that the other day. I mentioned in here a couple of Sundays ago what, about being consistent. You just, whatever it is you're doing, just be consistent at it. You may not know what to do in the natural in a particular situation, but the Holy Spirit knows to answer to all things. That, that's the most important thing. And you need to know that the Holy Spirit, he's not nervous. And, and, or he's not wondering what to do. He knows everything. Okay. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would teach us all things and he would cause you to recall, will remind you of and bring to your remembrance everything that he has told you, everything that you need to know. But you must renew your mind and be transformed by the word. Uh, I wanted to share this with you. You know, transform in the Greek means metamorphosis. Uh, an example of metamorphosis most of us would know would be like a worm becoming a butterfly. You know, that little measly crawling worm becomes this beautiful butterfly but before that worm became a butterfly he had to go through a process and I'm not going to give the whole butterfly story tonight but he had to go through a process God is telling us that we need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds and we need and that takes that takes effort and no it takes efforts it takes a lot of effort in closing let me say this when I think of something being transformed I, I think about my mom I think about how she could create be something beautiful uh, from what looked like nothing in the natural. You know, I came from a very large family uh, that lived on a farm down in North Carolina, and there were times when there was not an abundance of food. We had enough, but there was never an abundance. I can recall sometimes when my mom was getting ready to prepare a meal and there was not much to choose from. I can recall how she would go into the pantry and she'd get a little bit of this and a little bit of that and she'd come out and she'd mix it all together and she'd come out with this beautiful meal. It wasn't fantastic, but it was good. I mean, it was warm. It was a hot meal. It was great. It was to us, to us kids, it was great. You know, she could just put in, she'd always cook fresh biscuits to go with whatever she cooked. You know, you always got plenty of flour. <laughs> but you know, and she always, like I said, came out with a great meal. My mom was good at taking something that didn't look like much in the natural and turning it into something great. I also recall other things that my mom would do. My mom was a great seamstress. And back in that day, when I was growing up, like I said, we, we were very poor. Uh, it was a lot of kids, didn't have a whole lot. But at that time, they would purchase flour in 25-pound bags, and they would purchase the, the lard, the grease, in big tins, you know, maybe 10 pounds or 20 pounds. I'm not sure on the weight, but they were at large. And because, like I said, she made biscuits a couple, at least twice a day, every day. So you need a lot of flour. <laughs> but, in the, but the flour would come in these real pretty colorful bags. And so, my, like I said, my mom was a great seamstress. And so she would wash these flower sacks and, and she would make us some of the prettiest dresses for me and my sisters and my shirts for my brothers. And they also had bags that were beige and kind of a beige. And, and my mom would take these bags and she would bleach those out and get them real white. And she would make our underpanties out of that and our slips. Or, or shirts from my brothers for school, you know. And so my point is, my mom was able to take what she had and turn it into something pretty and useful, you know. Saints, that's what God has done with us. When we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, he took us and he molded us into his image and he created something beautiful. And when he looks at us, he sees something beautiful. He doesn't see rejects. He doesn't see you the way that you might be seeing yourself when you look in the mirror every day, but he sees you as beautiful. And that's what he does. And, that, and, and that's what he does when we confess his word. We speak it out, like we was talking about the two-edged sword. We speak it out, and then he takes his word, and then he creates something beautiful and useful out of it. In other words, you believe it in your heart, and then you speak it out of your mouth. It's, the, it's, it's really the number one way that you activate your faith. And I've said this before and will probably say it again. The power 
brothers and sisters, is in you. It's in me. Faith is activated when you speak, and without your confession, I want you to hear this, without your confession, there is no faith. He has nothing to create from. You know, when my mother was in the pantry gathering bits and odds and ends, that's what she was doing, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. She had something to work with. But if you don't give God a word, he don't have anything to work with. You've got to give it back to him so he can take that word and create a healthy body, a pros you know, prosperity in your thing, or a good job, or your family, reconciliation in your family. You've got to give it back to him. You know, and I was praying for my children, you know, most days. Saints, you know, the word tells you in Mark eleven twenty four that you can have what you say, but you need to get a revelation here tonight and know that you're going to get exactly what you say. And he's not talking, only talking about the good stuff. But you're going to get the negative things too. Because like I said, you are going to get what you say. For instance, you know, let me ask you this. Have you ever heard of the Miranda rights? Most people know that the Miranda rights, when the police come in to arrest somebody, they're authorized legally to read them, give them the Miranda rights. And the Miranda rights, which says anything you say can and will be held against you. And it's true. If you don't want your words to materialize, then you need to, you need to uh, speak them. They, they, they really will hold, uh, they really will be held against you. It, it's not it, like necessarily in the court of law, but in the universe, when you're speaking those words, every word you speak, this is why, you know, like I said, in, like in Miranda rights, they say, every word you speak, they warn you. Every word you speak can and will be held against you. And so usually they advise them, I, I wouldn't say, say anything until you get an attorney. They want the attorney there because he's smart enough to tell you to keep your mouth shut. And you need to listen to that inner voice. It's not your attorney, but he is an advocate. He is the Holy Spirit. Because the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is your teacher, your helper, your advocate, and your standby, according to the Amplified Version of the Bible. And so he is your everything. So you need to listen to that still, quiet voice. And we need to learn to fight the good fight with God's word. Do you agree? Yeah. So then remember, we're going to, unless we can say what God says, we're going to keep our mouth shut. Okay? I'm going to pray. Father, I thank you so much for this word tonight. God, I just honor, I just so thankful for all the things that you put in my spirit that were, weren't even in my notes, Lord. I thank you, Father, that there was things that you had me to speak here tonight that ministered to those that came here tonight. Maybe this one individual here or this one individually there, wherever they were, Lord, or maybe those online, you know, maybe there's someone online tonight that Lord wanted me to speak you wanted to speak through me to reach them. Uh, or maybe it could be somebody here. It could be both, Lord. Maybe there's somebody here and online that you wanted to use my mouth tonight to give utterance to something that you wanted them to hear, that you wanted to encourage them through me, Lord. They, they're through me, you wanted to give them a word of knowledge. You wanted to give them a word of wisdom, Lord. So, Lord, I thank you for that. And I thank you for those that did tune in to hear and get this word and those that came tonight to get this word. And, Father, I pray that they will get revelation, a new revelation, a new insight, and a new understanding, Lord, that you need to hear the word. You need to have them give your word back to you so that you can help them and, and, and quit tying your hands, Lord. Because when they're not speaking and agreeing with your word, you, they're tying your hands, Lord. So I pray they'll get a revelation tonight and begin to practice and begin to get renewed in their minds and into their spirits, Lord, and begin to just put their mouths, line their mouths up with what your word says. And again, Father, I just give you, the, I give you the praise, I give you the glory, and I just thank you. I just thank you. In Jesus' name, we praise you and we thank you. Amen.